Please be seated. Need to sit down and take a break after that last song. Okay. We're good. Good morning, brethren. It's good to be with you. Always a joy to be able to bring a message to the people of God. Just want to talk to Dennis Smith here just for a minute, just he and I. Hey, you know, one of the best things about being a preacher, you only work Wednesdays and Sundays. But... Once in a while, they sneak in an extra Sunday, like this year. 53 weeks this year, so you do get a little overtime sometimes. So It's always weird to put 53 there on the week uh, number. Um, brethren, tomorrow is that day. And, and what are we going to do with Christmas? We know that Christmas is a secular holiday. That is, it is a holiday that was ordained by man and not by God. We know that there are a, a lot of opportunities associated with Christmas. Like December 25th, is that the day Jesus was born? Well, no, it's not. The best I've seen scholarly laid out looks like somewhere in September is probably when he was born. So, we don't have the day, it's not the day Jesus was born, that's fine. Uh, my kids like to laugh, and I think it was uh, Molly who was over recently that got a, a good laugh on, we don't even know the year Jesus was born. Uh, best guess again that I've seen is that Jesus was born six years before Christ, which gets a little weird, but that's okay, that's okay. So we don't know the day, we know that, we don't, we don't know the year, and that's okay. Um, we see all the nativity scenes out there, and we know the problems with the nativity scenes, right? Uh, it wasn't like he was born in some shed. Uh, more than likely he was born in a common quarters that had the animals there as well. We know that the magi weren't there, probably weren't there for another couple of years, but again, we know all these things. We also know that it appears, I say we know and then I say it appears, so I guess I contradicted myself. It appears that this Christmas, as we have it, was a means of the early Roman Catholic Church to co-opt a pagan celebration time. There tend to be celebrations tied to solstices, solstice solstices, um, and people were, all these Pagans were coming into the, the church, into the faith, and uh, they were used to having a big shindig at the winter solstice, and so they took it over and said, here you go, we have Christmas. So what are we going to do with this? Some brethren, notice my words, some brethren, because of the way it was created, because of that co-opting, because of who instituted it, they have a really hard time celebrating it at all and so they don't and sometimes they go a little too far and are even greatly offended by it because they say either that's a Roman Catholic observance or they'll say that's a pagan observance and if they don't want to partake of Christmas I'm okay with that there's a couple good chapters I would refer you to on how to deal that deal with that most specifically uh, Romans 14 deals with it pretty well um, if we have brethren that are, are, are vehemently against celebrating it, we ought not put it in their face and make it an issue. We should do our best. But as we know, if you know your Romans 14, it works both ways too. Because some like to celebrate Christmas. I like to celebrate Christmas. Uh, a little while ago, I shared with you that being from the great white north, um, having that special holiday in the middle of the long dark is a wonderful thing to have a festival of lights. <laughs> to have something to be excited about and look forward to instead of dark and gloomy and cold 
and snow upon snow upon snow. So I look forward to it. Um, you look outside today, Christmas Eve, and it's beginning to look a lot like late spring, early summer. But it is what it is. Even up in Michigan, uh, even in uh, Jamestown, New York, they had what we often had up there. They had a white Thanksgiving, but they're going to have a green Christmas. It is what it is. But it's a wonderful holiday of family getting together and celebrating. And, and when you think about what it's about, that it, it's giving at least lip service to Jesus, you know. Uh, Santa and all the good Christian virtues behind that. It's all wonderful, good stuff. So if you want to partake, fantastic. If you don't want to partake, fantastic. Again, it is a secular holiday. I personally don't celebrate Arbor Day, so not a big deal, okay? What are we going to do with it? We can use it as a time to educate our religious friends or even our non-religious friends about the truth of the Bible. Because when we bring up those things like, you understand the Magi weren't there at his birth. Most people will say, what are you talking about? I saw it right out there. There's the plastic figurines right there. And to be able to take them to the Bible and say, see, if you look at this, you'll see he was probably closer to two years old when they showed up. Well, that's an interesting thing, and that can stimulate interest in what the Bible teaches about other things that maybe they've been misinformed or misled about. So a wonderful thing. What we don't want to do with Christmas is to use it as the proverbial stick to hit people with it. Don't you know nothing? That wasn't the case. Our manner and our tone. No, we should take the opportunity and use it. I have found, sadly, that this great opportunity to introduce people to the truth, they don't really care. Did you know the Magi were not there at his birth? Nope. We're done. Kind of like uh, when I try to drop those hints about, you know, you know when the world was created about a little over 6,000 years ago, they don't care. No interest, no follow-up questions. That's sad. So what are we going to do with this Christmas? If we don't do any of those things, brethren, let me recommend that we take it as almost a, a Christian thanksgiving. Because the birth of our Lord is one of the most amazing, if not the most amazing events. God put on flesh and tabernacled with us. From on high to down with us. What an amazing thing. And all the promises from Genesis through Malachi, that birth, that event, who knows when, it was the fulfillment of so much. Let us look at that and be thankful that our God loved us so much that as we read in Isaiah 53 and many other places, he was glad, he was willing, he loved us so much to come. Let's consider this morning just three types of promises that are fulfilled in a lowly town of Bethlehem. There are the salvation promises. The promise whose fulfillment was begun on a dark night in the small town of Bethlehem. God had promised by way of his speech with the serpent in the garden, that although he had said that on the day you eat of that fruit you will surely die, God showed mercy to us. And he gave us that promise that there would come one of the seed of woman who would destroy the works of Satan. And there's that beginning, that promise of salvation, mercy and grace. Later, in Genesis 22, our unified curriculum, we're hitting these areas. We just went through them not too long ago. Genesis 22 and verse 18, God focused that promise, not just seed of woman, but now seed of Abraham. Genesis 22 and verse 18. 
later in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 4, now Isaac, the son of Abraham. And then later in chapter 28, verse 14, now Jacob. So the promise to Abraham, the promise to Isaac, the promise to Jacob by the mouth of two or three witnesses, all things are established. So not just seed of woman, now the line of Abraham. That's why Jesus in John 3 could say to the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews, by way of the Jews, and make that chapter 4, uh, by way of the Jews. Why? Because the Jews are the descendants of Abraham. That promise was through them. Well, what happened on that night in Bethlehem? Well, if you read Matthew chapter 1, you'll see Jesus is descendant from a woman. Genesis 3.15. He is descendant from Abraham, 22.18. He is descendant of Isaac, 24.6. And he is descendant of Jacob, 28.14. That babe born on that night was a fulfillment of that promise. That incredible promise of a Savior who would come and crush the works of Satan. He also fulfilled on that night the promise of the prophet who would come. Let's do a little finger work together. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 18. The fifth book in our Bible, the last book of the Torah. Deuteronomy 18. In verse 18, God has tried to speak directly to the people, and they were terrified. So they said, no, have someone else speak to us for you. And God said, it's a good thing. Okay. Verse 18, he says, I will raise up for them a prophet, and the New King James capitalizes prophet because a clear reference to Jesus, as we'll see. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. This prophet was not only going to bring us the words of God, but these words of God that he was going to bring was the criteria of salvation, the criteria of judgment. Time went by. Much time went by. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 19. You remember when John the Immerser showed up on the scene and the religious leaders flocked out. There hadn't been a prophet in the land of Israel for over 400 years. Yet here comes one crying in the wilderness. Look at verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews, remember when John writes the Jews, he means the religious leaders of the Jews. The Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but he confessed and said, I am not the Christ. 400 years later, and they are looking. Are you the Christ? We've been waiting for the Genesis 3, 15, 22, 18. Are you that promise? I am not. Then they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? The book of Malachi, Revelation in the Old Testament, ends with Malachi writing that God would send forth Elijah to proclaim the coming of the Christ. So if you're not the Christ, are you Elijah? He says, I am not. And we know that there was a bit of a misunderstanding with them. It's not that God was going to resurrect Elijah, but as Jesus said, um, if you can tolerate it, if you can bear it, John is Elijah. And as we read in Luke, John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So technically, no, I'm not Elijah. But look at their next question. Are you the prophet? That's the Deuteronomy 18.18 18 promise. Okay, you're not the Christ. You're not the one who's going to herald the Christ. Are you this prophet? So it seems kind of clear that they didn't know exactly who this prophet was. They didn't realize that the prophet was going to be the Messiah, 
the Savior? And his answer, no. Turn now to John chapter 12. Begin verse 46, I believe. I'll go back to 44 to give you the full context of it. So Moses wrote that this prophet was going to be raised from among the Jews and that he would come and God was going to put his words in his mouth and he was going to speak those words and the people would be judged by the words that he spoke. Listen to what Jesus says about himself beginning in verse 44. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Notice. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words, he has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. What did Jesus say? I'm that prophet. God has given me his words. He's put them in my mouth. I have spoken them. I'm not judging you. These words will judge you. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Verses 11 through 15. This same John received a vision. And this vision here, a vision of salvation, of heaven, then and now, and that which comes. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. Remember what Peter said would happen at judgment? That the heavens and the earth would be burned up and the fervent heat. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And notice it, books were opened. There's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. And another book was opened, a third book, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. No more death. No more waiting. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Brethren, what are the book? The Old and New Testament? Are they not but the words of God? And the balcony says, Amen. The words of Jesus judging. On that night, whenever that was, a baby cried out. And that was the fulfillment of that promise, of that prophet, that Savior. There was also a promise of propitiation, tied. What were we going to be saved from? Well, from the death that we earned because of our sin. And you remember, in the garden, though they should have had that penalty put upon them for their sin, was not put upon them. But what was instituted immediately after? Animal sacrifice. Why? Read Hebrews, chapters 9 and 10 specifically. Because God allowed for a substitution. Another way to say it is a propitiation. For the wages of sin is death. Well, Adam and Eve didn't have to die. Mankind didn't have to all die for every one of their sins, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So an animal sacrifice, a substitution was allowed until the one would come who would redeem all that blood, who would pay the price 
Because as the Hebrews author tells us, the blood of bulls and goats cannot pay for our sins. Well, then why did he do it? It was a substitution. God allowed this substitution. And what do we read in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2? Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours alone, but for the entire world. What do we read in Galatians 4 and 5? That in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to what? To redeem those who were under the first law. He redeemed all that substitution. That night, whenever it was, when Jesus was born, this promise of the propitiation, and we've talked about it, but I guess I'll say it again. It's a beautiful concept. Propitiation is the satisfaction of wrath. If anybody breaks my whatever, I'm going to get some hide. H-I-D-E. Guess what happens? My whatchamacallit is broken. The hand is raised. I just need the hide. Bring it. All of us are guilty. All of us should have received that punishment. But Christ was willing to come, to pay that price, to die in our place, though he was without sin. And thus, his sacrifice could redeem those backwards and forwards. That 400-year silence, this is a neat thought. Maybe it holds up. 400 years of silence from God is broken by a baby's cry in lowly Bethlehem when God himself spoke in the flesh. That's good news, church. Wonderful promises fulfilled. Kingdom promises fulfilled. Promise from the kingdom spans all through the Old Testament. We knew that that kingdom was going to come. Remember, we've talked about Isaiah 2 and Joel 2 and um, Daniel 2, Isaiah 2 and Joel 2, all fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Joel 2 ties that coming kingdom with salvation. It's an important thing to consider and to look into. But the fulfillment of that promise that a kingdom would be established, the fulfillment was begun by a baby's cry in a night we don't know the day in lowly Bethlehem. God's people were promised a kingdom. And it was important to them because it would be a place where righteousness dwells. It would be a place where God's will would be done. On earth, as it is in heaven. It would be a place for all God's people to come together. And think of all the promises fulfilled. Well, the king of this kingdom was going to be of Judah. Genesis 49 and verse 10. And in Matthew chapter 1, what do we read? Jesus was not only of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also the next step of Judah. The Hebrews author tells us that's why he could not serve as a priest while he was in the flesh because he was of the tribe of Judah. This kingdom was going to be an everlasting kingdom. Daniel 2 and verse 44 talks about the fact that God was going to make this kingdom and that all kingdoms were going to flow into it and there would never be an end to this kingdom. No one would ever inherit it because it would never cease. Same thing in Isaiah 2 and in Micah 4. God spoke to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 through 16, and he said, In your seed, I'm going to establish this everlasting kingdom. And then he says it again. The kingdom I establish with you, through you, is an everlasting one. Matthew chapter 1, not only Abraham, not only Isaac, not only Jacob, not only Judah, but David too. Fulfilled all those promises. And the kingdom that was lost. In Ezekiel chapter 21, 24 through 27, God speaks to them before the destruction of Jerusalem, but they are already had the two captivities. Daniel's been taken to Babylon, and Ezekiel is by the river Kibar. 
And what does God say? Take off the turban. Take off the crown. Why? Because I'm done with Israel as a nation, as a kingdom that was supposed to be a physical representation and foreshadowing of the spiritual one. God says, we're done with this. Jeremiah chapter 22, 28 through 30, what does God say? This king of Judah, he is the last. This Jeconiah, mark him down as childless. He had children. Because no longer shall his heirs reign in Jerusalem. We're done with this kingdom. Well, Matthew chapter 1. Guess who Jesus is descended from? Not just Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, but Jeconiah. Well, then the Bible contradicted itself, didn't it? It said no, no descendant of Jeconiah would rule on the throne in Jerusalem. Jesus' kingdom is what? John 18 and verse 36. It's a spiritual kingdom. The Jews misunderstood. The kingdom was always a spiritual kingdom. And it had its influence or manifestation in the world in Israel. And now, where does the spiritual kingdom have its manifestation? Where does it have it, church? The church. The kingdom. Established. Everlasting. How everlasting? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew Chapter 16 and verse 18, he said he was going to build his church, that's the kingdom, and that the gates of Hades could not prevail against it. There's a twofold meaning there, church. One, death wasn't going to stop Jesus from building his church. And two, if I die tomorrow, do I leave the kingdom? No. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, when the end comes, Jesus is going to gather all the kingdom together and deliver it to the Father. So when I'm sitting in paradise, Lord willing, with all my brethren who have gone before, we are still in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. So many kingdom promises. You've probably heard the number of 300 plus promises that Jesus' birth and life fulfilled. The when of the kingdom was fulfilled. What did Daniel say in 244? He said in the days of these kings, referring to the Roman Empire, the where it was going to be fulfilled. Well, we know that Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, that it was out of Jerusalem the law would come when that kingdom was established. But where would that one come from the king who was going to build the kingdom? How about Micah chapter 5 and verse 2? Oh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you were little among Judah, out of you will come the one. And that's where Jesus was born. And he built his kingdom kingdom, his church, the what, all would flow into it. And even details all along the way. Uh, how was Jesus going to build this kingdom? Well, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, he's going to come riding on a colt. That's how he's going to do it. On and on. On that night, the beginning of all these promises was begun. Power promises, the power of God and His manifestation of it to save us, to overwhelm all the kingdoms of the world, all hosts of darkness that oppose Him. The power, how was He going to manifest it? Well, ultimately, it was in Christ. And in the formation of that kingdom, it was tied together that He was going to use His power to do that. And in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, He says the kingdom was going to come from power in that generation. Luke 24 and verse 49, he tells his apostles to stay in Jerusalem till they are endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, just wait a little bit longer until you receive power, which you will when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the church came with that power manifested in them. It established the church. God's power. For the lack of time, I would simply ask you to consider the counterintuitive aspect of God's power. What is the power of salvation? Is it a huge army of heavenly hosts? It is the Word of God. How were the works of Satan and all wickedness and all the devices of the 
spiritual enemies. How was it defeated? A great expression of power? Yes. God came in the flesh and died on the cross. That's his power. How was Jesus able to overcome the whole world? How was Paul able to turn the world upside down? Swords? Spears? Ballasty? The gospel. The truth. Christianity. That's God's power. How was mankind saved? By the death of a man. A man who was God in the flesh. Therefore, consider that night and the cry, the first cry of that babe. Can you wrap your mind about the most powerful being that has ever walked this earth? God in the flesh came as a helpless babe crying in the night. That was the power of God that saved all mankind, overtook, conquered all kingdoms of darkness. And yet, what did the world think of it? Rome had no knowledge of it and could care less. No one thought. I bet you there was some curiosity about some darkness. That was a strange thing. I wonder what that's about. But otherwise... No one cared. And in general today, most no one cares. They may give lip service. They may want to play church and play Jesus. But no one really cares. And we can feel very insignificant and very small, very powerless. And in the world's eyes, that's what we are. But brethren, remember. <laughs> remember who you are, right? Remember the salvation we have from the power of God. Remember the kingdom of which we are a part. A never-ending, everlasting, all-powerful kingdom created by God, not with hands. We are a part of that. And don't forget our power. We have the power of God in His Word. And we have the light of Christ in our lives, which the world may not be able to comprehend, but it cannot overcome. Remember who you are and be thankful because of what happened on some night we don't know when in lowly podunk Bethlehem. If you're not a Christian this morning, what happened that night? changed everything. Your sin condemns you to eternity, separated from God. And yet, because of that night, salvation can be yours. Your sins can be washed away. And you can begin an everlasting walk with your Father until that day comes when you see Him face to face. If you've never taken Him up on His offer of grace, why not this morning? Christians, don't be distracted by the baubles of this world they will be burned up in a fervent heat. Don't be distracted and, and tempted by the, the pride and the, and the position you can obtain on this ball of dirt. Because one day it will all be burned up. Never lose sight of what happened that one dark night in Bethlehem. Tie yourself to Him. Humble yourselves to Him. And keep on keeping on. An everlasting life is yours. If there's anything we can do to help you this morning, we ask that you come as together we stand and sing.